And thank you, Mission Church, for giving me the opportunity to come and spend some time with you today in the Word. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for your grace and your great mercy that you've given us today. And I pray your Holy Spirit would control all of our hearts, all of our minds. Control the words that I say. Control how they're taken. Let the angels dwell in this place. Let the demons be pushed back. Whatever evil thing has happened to us, whatever thing may be oppressing us, whatever may be on our hearts, help us to let it put aside for the moment and listen to the word. Listen to the spirit of prophecy. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to begin, friends, by reading again Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. And the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, we look at the, the seven churches, both as a literal local application of actual churches that were in that area, and also as a prophetic overview of the churches that would exist as time progresses just before the second coming. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we have identified ourselves, at least we're supposed to identify ourselves, with the Laodicean church. Now, the message of the Laodicean church is not the most flattering message. I don't know if you've noticed that. It's not the most flattering message, but it is a message that is necessary for us to hear to understand, and to obey. So I'm going to begin from the book Early Writings. I'm going to read from page 270, and we'll hear what the spirit of prophecy says. She says, Ellen White writes, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen, and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him or her to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear the straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what will cause the shaking among the people of God. I saw that the testimony of the true witness was not, has not been half heeded. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs. Let me read that part again. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. This testimony must work deep repentance. All who truly receive it will obey it and be purified. This is what she's commenting on the text of Revelation. So let's take a look a little bit more in depth as to what she said. With regards to the Laodicean message, she said, she said, it causes a shaking. Now, we often say a shaking, but what does that actually mean? The shaking, brethren, is a separation of fellowship. That's what it is. The shaking is a separation of fellowship. So what she is saying is that the church is going to go through a traumatic period of, of time in which there's going to be a separation of fellowship. And it is by God's order that it is so. It's by God's order that it is so. And so this we have to consider because this is a very, very important thing to understand that God himself is going to send a message that makes people split apart. We have to prepare ourselves, brethren, prepare ourselves not to be found on this part that separates away from Christ, but the part that separates away from sin, correct? We want to separate away from sin and we want, to, we want to come towards Jesus Christ. And none of us need to be of those who are shaken out. Not one here. And I don't want anyone here to be shaken out. I don't want anyone to be shaken out. We want to be shaken in, right? Because the shaking is also a shaking into the truth. It is a settling into the truth. It is saying, I am here. I will not be moved. Nothing will move me. I follow Jesus. Nothing else matters. That is also the purpose of the shaking. She says the separation is caused by those who refuse to hear and obey the message. Friends, who do you blame? Elijah or Ahab? Who do you blame? You can talk to me. It's all right. Who do you blame? Elijah or Ahab? Ahab. That's right. It's Ahab. Ahab was the one that was bringing in sin 
bringing in idolatry, destroying the truths that God has put before the people in the Bible. It was Ahab. It wasn't Elijah. Elijah was pointing it out. You know, but it's normal to want to shoot the messenger. The message is meant to lead to an inner reform of the heart. So this is what the purpose of God in giving us the Laodicean message. It's to lead to repentance. It's to lead to life. Friends, do you want to have life? Yes. I, I didn't hear too many people. Do you want to have life? Yes, you want to have life. We all want to have life. To have life, we have to repent. To have life, we have to listen to the message. The destiny, she says, the destiny of the church hangs on the message. And it has been lightly esteemed. Now consider for a moment. You've been thrown overboard. The waves are rolling. The ship is swiftly moving away from you. And the waters are extremely cold. Someone throws you a life rope. You don't like the color. I'm not taking that rope. That's blue. My favorite color is yellow. See, friends, it's been lightly esteemed. You've lightly esteemed the very thing that has been thrown out to save you. And this is what the church has done. It has lightly esteemed the message. And finally, she says, the testimony will work a deep repentance, obedience, and purity. Now, a little historical background on the church of Laodicea. All right. So if you don't know, and many of you may know, but this is for those who don't. Laodicea was a city in Asia Minor. OK, where modern day Turkey and a city that was so rich that after the earthquake of 60 A.D., all right, the citizens rebuilt the town on their own, refusing the help of Rome. They were vastly wealthy. It was a very, very wealthy city. The city produced a glossy black wool with long haired black sheep of the area from the long haired black sheep. So they had a, a black wool. They covered themselves and were, and were selling. And it made them very rich and also sold an eye salve, possibly made from the mud of Hierapolis, the thermal springs there. The city's water was supplied by these hot springs at Hierapolis. But by the time they reached the city, it was lukewarm and unpalatable. So it was very hot coming out of the spring. And as it meandered down, by the time it got to Laodicea, it was just it wasn't even cold. It was warm. And the meaning of the word Laodicea means a people adjudged, that is, a people given an official judgment. God has given an official judgment to Laodicea, and we must listen to it. And so when we look at the city of Laodicea, we get the following from it. It was self-sufficient, refusing help from Rome. It produced its own wool, its own covering. It produced its own eye cells. It drank from its lukewarm water. Now, this may be acceptable for a city, but Jesus says this is not acceptable for his people. Now, the Bible says here, And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful, true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, in the Greek word, or in the Greek, the word angelos, OK, in the New Testament, where it says the angel typically refers to an actual angel, to a, a physical being that lives, you know, in heaven and sometimes comes down here and works with us. But it's also applied to humans in Matthew eleven ten. So simply meaning that the messenger is one who is sent. They can be an angel, an actual being that's an angel, or it can be a human being that is sent by God. Now, it's evident that the angelos are distinguished from among the church as they are addressed as the angelos of the church, right? So unto the angel of the church of Laodicea, right? So the primarily the message is to the messenger, the messengers of the church. So from this, it is evident that the angelos are the messengers or the message bearers of the church, the pastors, the elders, the teachers. That is who Jesus is primarily addressing. Now, Revelation 3.22, like we read, or like was, like was read already, it does say, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. So that the church as a whole is included in the message. But it is primarily, first and foremost, 
to the leadership. That is who it goes to. Now notice what Ellen White says with respect to the influence of leadership. The great danger with our people has been of depending upon men and making flesh their arm. Those who have not been in the habit of searching the Bible for themselves. Notice, searching the Bible for themselves. Brethren, you have to ask yourself, do I search the Bible for myself? Do I take time myself to read or do I just listen to sermons? As good as they can be, that's, that's only part of it. You have to search the Bible for yourself. Or weighing evidence and have confidence in leading men and accept the decisions they make and thus many will reject the very messages God sends his people. I'm going to read that part again. Those who have not been in the habit of searching the Bible for themselves or weighing evidence, have, having confidence in the leading men and accept the decisions they make and thus many, many, not few, many will reject the very messages God sends to his people if these leading brethren do not accept them. So if the leading brethren don't accept the messages and you are a person who doesn't weigh evidence for yourself, who doesn't seek the truth for yourself, who doesn't open the Bible for yourself, you will be lost as they are. Because God is sending them messages, they refuse to tell you, and then you're believing them and not the Bible. This is exactly the situation that we find over and over and over again in Scripture, specifically when the days of Jesus. In the days of Jesus, the people ignored to a great deal what they could see, what they could hear from Christ, and they looked to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the lawyers to see, did they accept it? And if they would have accepted Christ, then they would have accepted it. But because they didn't do that, many refused Jesus Christ. She says, the Lord will raise up men who will give the people the message for this time. If God's leaders refuse to give the message for this time, and friends, a message for the time is never popular. It's, it's never popular. It is always very pointed. It is always uncomfortable. It is always calling us to a decision. And look, as I'm speaking, I'm speaking to myself. I am with you in the Laodicean church. I'm no different than you. I have struggles. I have things that we go through. And I struggle with it. I struggle being a Laodicean preaching to Laodiceans. <laughs> you know, so I'm with you. She also says, we must not trust to others to search the scriptures for us. Some of our leading brethren have frequently taken the position on the wrong side. And if God would send a message and wait for these older brethren to open the way for its advancement, it would never reach the people. It would never reach. Brethren, we cannot be Seventh-day Catholics. Okay? A Seventh-day Catholic listens only to what the pastor says. Should we listen to what the pastor says, what the minister says? Yes, but go home, compare it with the scripture, compare it with spirit prophecy. And if it doesn't fit, then stop listening. It's that simple. Because we're entering into a point in time, understand. Look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to Jeremiah for a moment, okay, just very quickly. I'm going to turn to Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5, and I'm going to read the last couple verses of that, of that chapter. It says this in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 30 and 31. Now listen carefully. A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. Now the term wonderful doesn't mean it's good. It's wonderful in the bad sense. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. And what will you do in the end thereof? People, priests, prophets, all together, ears off, not listening to God. This is the danger of Laodicea. This is the danger that we face. So you must, you must study for yourselves. You must know for yourselves what the Bible says. Because you will not be able to tell unless you have that connection with Christ. Do not rely on the leaders. Listen, hear, work, pray with them. But only God is God, brethren. Do you hear what I'm saying? Only God is God. And only he is your leader. And only he is the head of this church. No man. 
Only God. And we must not be Seventh-day Catholics who look to pastors like priests because there's too much of that going on. She talks about this going on. Do you remember the vision that she had? I don't know if you've ever read it. When she, she sees in vision men coming to her, Ellen White sees in vision men coming to her, men that she knew. And then she looks again out the window, and now it's a Catholic procession holding a cross. And they go walk around her house, and they say, this is prescribed. You have spoken against our holy order. We have to be careful. We are nearing the close of time. Think not that Satan is not going to try to put his rule and his precepts amongst the holy people. Read Daniel 11, the last verse. Where does Satan try to put his throne? Brethren, we are, we are in, a, in a very difficult state. And God has given us a, a hard message, but it requires such a hard message because Jesus wants to save us. He wants to bring us to him. He wants to bring us to fruition in his heart, right? He wants us to grow. He wants us to have the love, his love. He wants us to know what it is to be true Christians, no matter what the world and Satan throws at us. Now, I would say that I'm going to read this part here too. This is from Special Testimonies to Ministers, page 19. Ellen White says, that of those, some of the ministers that were at the 1888 conference, she says this, but all the universe of heaven witnessed the disgraceful treatment of Jesus Christ represented by the Holy Spirit. Had Christ been before them, they would have treated him in a manner similar to that which the Jews treated Christ. That's hard. That's hard. Because we like to imagine that we wouldn't be one of them. But we have to be careful. Do you remember when Jesus, you remember when, the, when the, the, uh, the Jews said to Christ, Abraham is our father? What did Jesus say? No, your father is who? The devil. Can you imagine the shock? Can you imagine the shock that they went through? But Abraham is our father. No, no, Jesus said. The reality of the situation is that your father is the devil. Friends, we have to be very, very careful. The, 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 the uh, message, the message of the Laodicean church is, to, is not to point at fingers. It's to point inward. Okay? God is pointing to us. God is asking us to look at our hearts, open our hearts. Are we of the spirit of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Or are we of the spirit of those who will accept him? Now it says, Revelation again, 3.14, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now remember, everything that I said before, it applies more to the leadership, but applies to the people. It applies to all of us. And I want to say this, that remember that a, a church rises no higher than its ministers. Okay? It's very rare that any church will surpass its minister. A church typically rises no higher than its ministers. That is why God gives the message first to the ministers, but also then to the people. Now, Jesus calls himself in this text, Revelation 13, or Revelation 3.14, the Amen, or verily and truly is what Amen means, verily or truly. Now, John records Christ saying verily, verily many times. Okay, verily, verily, I say unto you. Truly, truly, I say unto you. Now, Jesus presents himself to the Laodicean church as the truth. He is the verily. He is the truth. Why would Jesus have to tell the Laodicean church that he's the truth? Doesn't the Laodicean church believe the truth? Well, there's something with the, there's a problem with the Laodicean church that they have one specific area. It's not so much the theology that they have a problem with, but it's the, it's accepting the estimate of Christ gives to the Laodicean church. It's accepting the estimate of Christ he gives to their character. That's the problem. You see, Laodicea is very much like Peter, okay? It's eager to work, right? Laodicea is eager to work, it's eager to speak, and it's eager to boast of its loyalty. But it's not very eager to listen. Did Peter listen very well? No, he didn't. Peter didn't listen very well. Peter was not eager to hear that Jesus must be crucified 
Because what did that mean for him? Well, he might have to have some crucifixion himself, crucifixion of the self, right? Peter was not eager to hear that his boasting is a fraud. Do you remember what Peter said? Lord, I'm going to follow you everywhere. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to be with you. And what did Jesus say? No, no, no. Before this animal cries three times, or cries, you're going to deny me three times. Right? That's what Jesus said. And Peter didn't believe him. Peter was not eager to hear that he would deny Christ. And friends, I know we're not eager to hear that we make Jesus sick. And this is the bottom line. It doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't love us. He does. But our lukewarmness makes him ill. It gives him a queasy stomach. He wants to spew us out of his mouth. Have you ever been working on a hot day and you just want a nice cold drink and you grab something and you drink it, but it's been out in the sun and now it's this kind of lukewarm, ugh, right? You know what I'm talking about. That's how Jesus is. Friends, don't you want to be refreshing to Christ? I didn't hear too many people. Do you want to be refreshing to Christ? Amen. I want to be refreshing to Christ. Don't you, don't you want your house to be a place like Lazarus' home, where Jesus loved to go to Lazarus' house because it was a place where he could feel at home? That's what we want. We need to be hot or cold, right? You make tea when you're hot, make a nice refreshing drink when you're cold. No, technically we shouldn't be cold, right? We want to be hot. That's where we want to be. But that's why Jesus has to say, I'm the amen. I'm the faithful and true witness. Believe what I'm telling you. Because Laodicea doesn't want to hear it. It's hard to hear. It's hard to hear you're lukewarm. You, it's just hard to hear you make Jesus sick. That's not good. That's not good. I don't want to make Jesus sick. I don't intend to make Jesus sick. And Laodicea does not intend to make Jesus sick. Peter did not intend to do what he did. But the reality is, is that's where we're headed. Now, Jesus also calls himself the beginning of the creation of God. The RK. All right? RK in the Greek. Applied to Jesus, it is one who begins or the prime mover. Okay? So Jesus as the RK, the beginning of the creation of God, doesn't mean that Jesus began or was created at some point. It means that he is the primal point from which all creation stems. Why would Christ have to remind us that he's the creator? Why would Christ have to remind the Laodicean church that he is the beginning of the creation of God? Is it maybe because the Laodicean church will face issues that directly attack the book of Genesis? And that's exactly what's going to happen. What do you find early on after the creation? was finished. What do you find? The Sabbath. After the creation was finished, you find the Sabbath. What do you find early on when Adam and Eve were created? You find what? Marriage. You find marriage. You find that God created them male and female. Okay? Is the church today facing issues on the Sabbath? Not as much, but it will in the future. But is the church today facing issues on sexual identity? Is the church today facing issues on marriage? Yes, it is. Because society is moving in a direction that is completely antithetical to what the Bible says is true. And so the message to the Laodicean church, friends, this is it. The church has to stand on these issues and it has to stand boldly and rightly. With love, but with righteousness. Because if it does not, it will be numbered with the transgressors. Do you want to be numbered with the transgressor? I don't. I do not want. I do not want God's frown. I want God's smile. And that's what we need, brethren. And that is why Jesus says he's the beginning of the creation of God, because he knows the church of Laodicea faces the end time issues. Satan attacking the book of Genesis and the truths that are there attacks the very foundation of Seventh-day Adventist faith, of Christian faith, of Protestant faith. And if we let that go, you've let everything go. The latest message calls for reform in these areas. 
And there will be those of us, there will be those among the church that will not stand for this. Like Judas, they will do what Judas did. Listen to what the spirit of prophecy says. As the storm approaches, now she's talking about, this is from the uh, GC, this is the 1888, uh, Great Controversy, page 608. She says, as the storm approaches, the context here is the coming Mark of the Beast, Sunday rest by law. Okay, that's what she's talking about. A large class. Now, the word large, is that few or many? It's many. A large class. These are her words. Who have professed faith in the third angel's message? Are these Seventh-day Adventists or no? Yes, they're Seventh-day Adventists. But have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth and abandoned their position and joined the ranks of the opposition. They switch sides. They switch sides because what happens is when you're in a time of crisis, that's no time to build your character. The time to build your character is in a time of general peace when you are doing well, when things are going well, when there's not so much persecution or crisis. A crisis reveals the cracks. And if you've got cracks in your spiritual armor, if you've got cracks in your life with Jesus, they will now be exposed. There were cracks, friends, brethren, in what we've experienced in the last three years. There have been cracks, and they have exposed. And the church, I will say the church, is splitting. There's no way to stop it. It's going to continue to do it. The world is splitting. The world is being split into different groups and different factions, and this happening in the church. And God is telling us that we have to get ready. It's time to seal the cracks with the love of Jesus and with the truth. Amen? Do you want to have the seal? You want to seal the cracks? Do you don't want to be cut off from Christ? Friends, how long have some of you been in the faith? How long? Do you want to go this far and give up now? Do you want to come this far and give up now? Not me. <clears throat> not me. And I hope none of you either. Because we have to keep going. The road is going to be harder. Next year, next year I'm afraid of some of the things that are going to happen. I'm afraid of some of the things that are happening. Because this year some things were set up. I don't have time to get into it. It's a whole other, <laughs> it's a whole other presentation. You can see some of them. If you go to my YouTube channel, Prophet from Prophets, look up Marco Kolich, M-A-R-K-O-K-O-L-I-C. Okay, you can see some of my stuff there. But it's things are setting up now, and they're going to get worse, much worse. Do you know that Ellen White predicts that there's going to be food riots in the United States, in Russia, in India, in China? She mentions those, city, those cities specifically. There's going to be food riots and civil war. Friends, can you imagine civil war in the cities of America? This is going to be something we have never yet experienced. The world has not yet experienced. And we must be ready. And the Laodicean message is there to get us ready. It's, she says, by partaking, by uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, this large class, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. In the last three years, was there an easy, popular side? Was there a difficult side? Did things at first were voluntary? Oh, just, just put this on or stay away from this person. Don't go to visit that person. And maybe you should inject yourself with this. And then it began from being voluntary and it began from voluntary to you must do this. You will do this or you will not be able to have a job. You will not be able to, you know, live, basically. It's a soft way to, to, to kill people. You take away a man's job, you're trying to kill him. You take away a person's social life, you're trying to destroy their spirit. You're trying to split people. This is what's been happening. It is prepared. The spirit of the mark of the beast must come first. Then cometh the mark. The world will be groomed for it. You'll be prepared for it. 
And as it comes, those who have made the popular easy decision are now going to find it very simple to accept the mark of the beast. And Ellen White says it's a large class of Seventh-day Adventists that are going to do this. Don't be part of that class. You know, I was I graduated in the class of 92. Okay, that might give you an idea of how old I am. So I'm in the class of 92. This class you don't want to be part of. You don't want to graduate from the school of the mark of the beast. You understand what I'm saying? You don't want the diploma. Okay, you don't want the diploma. You don't want the certificate. No matter how much they offer you, if they offer you a PhD with lots of money, don't take it. Don't take it. You'll regret it. But when you take it, it'll be too late. And friends, Adventists have this test before anyone else because we see it coming. God sifts us first, brethren. The Laodicean message is doing its work. It is going out right now. The Laodicean message is shifting people. It's moving people. And people are making decisions. Hearts are being hardened or softened, even right now. This is what's going on. Brethren, are you ready? Okay, two people. It's okay to talk back to me. That's all right. Brethren, if you're not ready... It's time to get ready. Amen. Amen. But don't wait too long. And then that's it. Jesus knocks. But eventually your heart gets so hard, you won't hear it anymore. Do you understand what I'm saying? Keep your heart soft. Keep your mind sharp. Keep your ears open so that God can come in and save you and save your family and save the church. Some churches won't be saved. Whole churches will fall away. They will. And we already know that. You can't have a church, a Seventh-day Adventist church, give a homosexual graduation ceremony. Okay? You can't do that. La Sierra University, I'm calling them out because they themselves have placed it everywhere. Homosexual graduation on the Sabbath. They usually don't do stuff on Sabbath. So don't tell me that whole churches won't fall away. If you're in that church, flee. Run. Don't walk. Get in the fastest car you can. And pray to Jesus. In verse 15 and 16 of Revelation 3, it says, I know thy works. Thou art neither hot nor cold. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Jesus gets to the point here, friends. Again, speaking first to the leadership and then to the church in general, because we each have our own personal walk with God. Yet God first addresses the leaders because he's, he's asked the leaders to lead. God has asked men to come forward and to bear the burdens and to do the work and to organize and do these things. And by and large, we should listen. We should work with the brethren that are called. But when they do not do what God says, we must warn them and then do what Jesus said. If they refuse, Jesus says, leave them alone. Do your own thing. I've given you a work. Friends, every one of you here has a work. We all have a work. But to the leadership, he says this, because you're lukewarm, neither cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. No greater indictment can be leveled at a church than this. The lukewarm state of the waters. Friends, how did, how did Laodicea get lukewarm water? What did I say at first? The springs are far away, right? They're far away. And as they meander and as they get towards the city, they get colder and colder and colder. And time, brethren, time from the, the amount of time, slowly, slowly starts to cool the hot life that you were given. So by the long route, the water's cooled off, not enough to be refreshingly cold, just enough to be disgustingly lukewarm. Notice what Ellen White says about the, about the message. Listen to what she says. I saw that the testimony to the Laodiceans applied to God's people at the present time. All right? 
And the, and the reason it has not accomplished a greater work is because of the hardness of their hearts. But God has given the message time to do its work. Amen? You want some time? He's giving you some time. She goes on to say, Nearly all believed that the message would end in the loud cry of the third angel. But as they failed to see the powerful work accomplished in a short time, many lost the effect of the message. You see what I'm saying? As time progressed from 1844 all the way till today, things have gotten a little bit cooler. We've chilled out, as they say. But that's not what God wants. Time should have nothing but an effect for us is to bring us into more communion with God, not give us cooler hearts and softer, mushy brains. Right? As we study the scriptures, we see the conviction. As we read the spirit of prophecy, we understand the truth. And friend, don't think that you can just jettison the spirit of prophecy. It's been given to us now. And those who claim that they're just going to get their truth out of the Bible, when the Bible says don't despise prophesying, what are you going to do with that? So God gave it to us. When a prophet speaks, you can't let it go. You can't let it go. You got a prophet from the prophets. It's the name of my ministry, prophet from prophets, shameless plug, I'll admit. But you have to profit from the prophets. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall he be established. Believe in his prophets, so shall you prosper. Second Chronicles 20.20, right? Laodicean condition is the appearance of Christianity without being Christian. Can't have that anymore. We must be Christian. We must allow Jesus to come into the heart. We don't want to make Jesus sick. And if we listen to the message, we will no longer make Jesus sick. We will make him happy. Now it says, because thou sayest, I am rich. Okay. If we go down to verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now I'm going to deal with the the second part of the verse first, and then we're going to get to the first part. So the second part again was, and knowest thou not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Okay, so let's take a look at this very quickly. Number one, and knowest not. Remember, like Peter, did Peter know what his heart was really about? He was really willing to cut off an ear, but was he really, really willing to suffer for Jesus? He was willing to hurt others for Jesus, but he was not willing to take pain for Jesus. All right? Peter didn't know his heart. Laodicea doesn't know their heart either. This is part of the problem. And then the word wretched appears. Do you want to be wretched? No, I don't want to be wretched. But the fact is we are wretched. Hmm. We are wretched. And the word wretched is interesting. It appears only in Romans 7.24. When Paul is talking about the wretchedness, his, oh, wretched man that I am. Paul talks about the man who struggles to do good, and he finds he does evil. Now, does Paul admit his wretchedness? Yes. Does Laodicea? No. No. That's the problem. Yeah, it is some arrogance. That's right. There is arrogance in Laodicea. Paul admits the wretchedness. So let's do what Paul did. Okay? You don't have to put your hand up or anything. You don't have to say it out loud, but I'm wretched. Friends, we're all wretched. We're wretched without Jesus. And it's not about the message of the Laodicean in church. is not about putting ourselves down and whipping ourselves. Oh, I'm such a horrible person. That's not what it's about. It's about coming to an understanding of our true condition and allowing the balm of Jesus Christ's love to heal it. That's what it's about. So it's not about making us feel like we're degenerates and de dejected and we're terrible. There should be some self-reflection. There should be an honest look. When you look at Christ and you look at yourself, you'll get a better idea where you're at. Right? And I feel pretty wretched when I do that. But what does Jesus say? Let me touch you. Let me hold you. Let me take that all away. That's what he says. So the wretchedness the wretchedness we must admit. Miserable, Jesus says of us. You are miserable. Is anyone here miserable today? No. There might be some. 
If you are, God be with you. You know, we're all going through difficult times. Brethren, pray for each other. Pray for your church. Pray for your neighbors. But the miserable have no hope in the resurrection. And so we don't want to be miserable. And we should not be miserable because Jesus has given us his love and his great grace and mercy. He's given us the truth and the spirit of prophecy. He's given us the, the promise that he'll be with us through every trial. When I went through what I went through this last three years, uh, by God's grace, he has been sustaining myself and my wife. Um, people have been, have, you know, been generous and, and helped us out in a ministry. I've started my own ministry. And so what initially I felt quite wretched, but God has been blessing. So I want you to know that, uh, remember, when the mark of the beast comes, it's going to be an economic sanction and an embargo. That is, you won't be able to buy or sell. So we have to be ready to give up our jobs and things now. So if something comes to you that requires you to, to give up your work or your, your place of employment, and because if you did not, you would be transgressing God's commandment, it is better to transgress your employment than your, the commandment. Understand? God will take care of you. We have to develop that faith now. This is what Laodicean message is supposed to give us. Jesus said, you are poor. You are poor. Does Laodicea think it's poor? No, it doesn't think it's poor. It's rich. And in fact, the church is actually quite wealthy. There are many pe wealthy people within the church, and the church actually has uh, a large store of funds. So the church is wealthy. But the problem is, is that the wealth of the church has acted like a glittering thing that has attracted it away from the glittering gold that is the, that is the very character of Christ. The church is blind, Jesus says. Now, this, friends, is especially deadly. I'm going to turn to John chapter 3, verse 19. John chapter 3, verse 19. And it says, and this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. It's the love of evil and, and the desire to stay away from truth. Blindness. This blindness friends, is deadly. Naked. Do you want to go to a naked church? Well, I guess a lot of people do want to go to a naked church. I only heard one no. Friends, do you want to go to a naked church? No. No, don't go to a naked church. You know, there actually is a naked church. Don't go there. I'm, I'm warning you right now. Don't go to the naked church. It says the church is naked. Now, that is scary, isn't it? You ever had those dreams and you're walking around and you realize you're missing something? Friends, a naked church is a church put to shame. A naked church is a church that is not hiding in Christ, but is in shame with the rest of the world. We can't be a naked church. We have to be a clothed church. That's the thing. Don't go to naked church. Go to the church that has the righteousness of Christ. And what is the response of the leadership and the laity? Well, now it's in the first part of verse 17. It says, I am in, that, that the Laodicean church says, I am in rich and increased with good and have need of nothing. Like Peter, the Laodicean church does not agree with the estimate that Christ has put on its character. It says, not so, Lord. I'm going to defend you. I'm doing well. I'm not doing wrong. What are you talking about? I'm not naked. I'm not blind. I'm not wretched. No. This is the problem. The Laodicean church does not accept what Jesus says. We must accept what Jesus says. We must accept the testimony of Christ. The response of Laodicea is self-justification, self-righteousness, self-aggrandizement, self-exaltation, self-reliance, and self-esteem. Okay? It's selfish. Selfishness. You know, that's a dangerous sin. Laodicea is arguing with God. But look at the money. Look at the work. Look at the Bible studies. Yeah. Do that. But do it in Christ not of your own power and selves. Friends, none of our excuses move God. But you know what does move God? 
an honest appeal to his mercy, an honest confession of our failures. That moves God because he sees that person can be touched. That person, I can work with that one. I'm going to work with that humble one. I'm going to work with the one who doesn't rely on himself, the one who doesn't rely on herself. It's good to have training. It's good to have knowledge. It's good to have wisdom. But God, God is the one that has to bring us to that point of softness of heart, of truth. God is the one that has to, that has to bring us to that point where we say, Lord, Abba, Father, I'm, I've messed up again. And you know the good news about the uh, sanctuary message, unto 2300 days, and then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. As God goes deeper and deeper into your heart, eventually he finds the last thing, and you throw it out, and you have peace with God. It's actually a beautiful message. It's not a message of fear. Don't be afraid of the sanctuary message. Don't be afraid of the message to Laodicea. Because this message is beautiful, and it leads us to exalt the high standard. I counsel thee, in verse 18, to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Gold, friends. What is this gold? It says in the Spirit of Prophecy, the gold mentioned by Christ, the true witness, which all must have and has been shown to me to be faith and love combined. Faith and love is the gold. Faith and love. And love takes precedence of faith. Satan is constantly at work to remove these precious gifts from the hearts of God people. All are engaged in playing the game of life. Satan is playing a game for you. Satan has wagered on your failure. Do you want to prove him wrong? Do you want to break that wager? Oh, I do. I want to please Jesus. And I also, I'm going to admit this, I also want to wring the devil's nose. I'm sorry. But that, that guy's bad. That guy's really, really bad. And I've seen some terrible things that people have done to each other and terrible things that people have suffered. You know, I worked in a, in a prison. I've seen what Satan has done in families and, and, and the evil, evil things, horrible, terrible things that Satan has moved people to do to each other. That guy's bad. And so I want to win the wager. I want to give Jesus what he paid for. This old, rebellious, stupid person. This weak, cantankerous Marco. I want to give him that. And I want him to give me the cleansed, the washed clean, the peaceable Marco. And I want Jesus to get what he paid for, even though... I don't feel I'm worth it, but he made me worth it. And I want the devil to lose. And I want the devil to lose for you too. Let the devil lose. Let Jesus win. The white raiment, friends. The white raiment. What is that? Revelation 19, verse 8. Revelation 19, verse 8 says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. You know, Laodicea made its own black wool. But Jesus says, that's not good enough. The black wool that you make, it might look nice. Might have a nice suit, you know, might have a lovely dress, but that's not good enough. Jesus wants to give you the white robe of light. The white robe that he purchased at, at an infinite cost to him. At an infinite cost. This is what Jesus wants you to be clothed with. No man can of himself understand his errors, she writes. In Christ Object Lessons, page 159. The lips may express a poverty of soul that the heart does not acknowledge. While speaking to God of poverty of spirit, the heart may be swelling with the conceit of its own superior humility. Oh, Lord, I'm so humble. Praise Jesus. That's not what you're supposed to do. <laughs> right? That's not what you're supposed to do. In one way and one way only can true knowledge of self be obtained. We must behold Christ. So as you, as you look, at Jesus, look at Jesus, you have to read the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and pray. That's how you look. You can't literally peer into the heavens and see Jesus. All right? You may not get a vision. 
But you will see Jesus by faith. What did Jesus say? Blessed are those that have not seen and still believe. That's right. Have you seen Jesus? I haven't seen Jesus. I've seen the character of Jesus, but I haven't seen Jesus. I've seen Jesus in the pages of Scripture. I've seen Jesus in the spirit of prophecy. I've seen Jesus in the goodness and the love of my fellow brethren. That's a beautiful thing. When you see Jesus and love in your fellow brethren, that's a beautiful thing. But I haven't seen him with my eyes yet, but one day I will. And I plan to see him in peace. Do you? Amen. When we contemplate his purity, his excellence, we shall see our own weakness and poverty and defects as they really are. We shall see ourselves lost and hopeless, clad in garments of self-righteousness. Like every other sinner, we shall see that if we are sa ever saved, it will not be through our own goodness, but through his infinite grace. It's okay to know your condition because Jesus heals that condition. When you go to a doctor, you want him to tell you the truth. Your leg is gangrenous. It's about to fall off, but he says, no, nah, you're good. Take a couple aspirin. You should be fine by tomorrow. You're going to die. You're going to die if he doesn't tell you the truth. You're going to die if he doesn't amputate. Friends, that's what Jesus has to do. This is an emergency. We are in a state of emergency. Do you understand? Laodicea, this is an emergency. The red light is going around, you know, like we just heard an alarm. That's an emergency. We are in an emergency. God is giving us an all call. Wake up, brethren. Wake up. As many as I love, finally, we get to this verse. As many as I love. Whew. It's been hard up to this point. It's been tough. It's been tough what Jesus has been saying. But then he says, as many as I love, I rebuke. Have you felt rebuked today? I felt rebuked today. And if you felt rebuked today, that means you're a son and a daughter. If you felt the rebuke of God for our own foolishness, our own silliness, God is treating you as a son or daughter. And that means he loves you. That means he hasn't cast you aside yet. Trust me. If you don't hear anything from Jesus, you're not his. You're not his. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Who likes being chastened? I see no hands. Well, mine's not going up either. I don't like being chastened, but it's necessary. You have to chasten your children. You have to teach them the way of the Lord. It's just the way things are in a sinful world and a sinful earth. But by God's grace, the chastening doesn't have to lead to destruction. Now, some of us may need more chastening than others. Don't make Jesus do that to you, brethren. Jesus doesn't want to do it. Do you understand that God, he doesn't want to punish. He doesn't want to destroy. He doesn't want to do any of these things, but we force his hand. Israel forced his hand over and over and over again. And our own people, we have forced God's hand sometimes to chasten us in our lives. Instead of chastening us, let's chase him. Okay? And that way we'll stop making Jesus sick. Instead of chastening Instead of being chastened by God because we're running away from what he wants us to do, let's instead chase God because he wants us to be with us and we want to be with him too. That's what we need. That's what we need. Don't worry, friends. I'm, I won't be too much longer. Behold, it says, I stand at the door and knock. I've already spoken about this a little bit. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and be with him. Do you want Jesus to come have supper at your place. Could you imagine if you heard a knock on the door? And you said, who is it? It's Jesus. I'm hungry. Would you let him in? Absolutely. Absolutely. Come in, Jesus. You know, you hide the cheese. You know, maybe not, maybe not too much veggie links. No, I'm, I'm jesting with you a little bit, brethren. But it would be a grand thing for Jesus to come and sup with us. And that's what he's literally going to do in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants to live in your house, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, in your heart. You know, I know sometimes, I, I mean, I thought myself, man, would it have been something to have been around in the first century to see Jesus walk, to, to walk with him and all these things. But Jesus says, it's better for you that I go away. Because then the Holy Spirit will come. 
And the Holy Spirit is going to dwell even closer than just in your house. He's going to dwell in the house of your heart. That's where he wants to be. Do you want to let him in? Let him in, brethren. Let him in. That's where he wants to be. Meditation, watchfulness, prayer. Many lose the blessings of religious services, Ellen White says, and find themselves more destitute than before they received it. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day contemplating the life of Christ. You think about those who you love, right? Especially when they're away, right? You think about your mom, your dad, your, your sister, your brother, you know, a friend. Think about Jesus. Take some time to make his heart glad. You know, friends, sometimes we look at this too much at ourselves. We don't look at how God hurts. We don't look at how God feels. I don't want him to serve with my sins anymore. I'm not saying I'm perfect. You know, I'm struggling too with things. But let's take a look at how God feels. Let's look at it from his perspective. He wants to bring sin to a close. There are horrible things happening in the world today. There's horrible things happening in our, in our lives. Jesus wants to bring it to a close. And I'm going to bring it to a close too. I won't, I won't take any more time. But friends, how do we not, how do we stop from making Jesus sick? We need to hear and accept the testimony. Do you want to hear and accept the testimony today in the name of Jesus Christ? Raise your hand with me. Do you want to hear and accept the testimony? Amen. Amen. Do you want to confess to repent? Do you want to confess and repent to Jesus? Yes, I want to confess and repent to Jesus. Do I need to buy from Jesus gold? Yes, I do. Jesus, I need the gold. I need the garment. I need the eye salve. And I'm going to say like Peter, don't just wash my feet. Wash me all. Wash all of me. That's what we need. Brethren, are you willing to accept the message of the Laodiceans today? Are you willing to accept the rebuke, knowing that it's the rebuke of one who loves you? Are you willing to accept it? Are you willing to accept it? I don't hear too many voices. Are you willing to accept it? Amen. We must all accept it. I want all of us to accept it. And as we leave the sanctuary today, Let's leave with some thinking of Christ. Let's leave with some humility and some contemplation. Let us leave the sanctuary today saying, Lord Jesus, I need you. I need you. Come into my heart. Am I Laodicean? What's wrong with my heart? I can't see my own self. Reveal me to, reveal me, to me. And then we can cry like David, renew a right spirit within you, O God. So what will you do today, friends? Will you accept? The message of the Laodicean church. I accept the message of the Laodicean church. I want to accept it. I want Jesus in my heart. And I want to be saved. And I want you to be saved too. Let's pray. Oh God of heaven, we want to thank you for your grace and mercy. And I pray that, I pray Lord that everyone here who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches. Lord, Give us that power. Give us that strength. You give us the promise. We will sit on your throne. We will see you face to face. Lord Jesus, don't let the devil have victory over us to lead us in a wrong way. I pray for everyone here. I pray for myself. I pray for my wife. I pray for, for all of us. Bless us, Lord. Take pity on us and lead us in the right way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.